Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a project called Vendi. Um, it started, um, some of you may have seen a talk I gave a few years ago at Erlang DC on a program called Wingman, and this has been the evolution of that. Um, so the, the basic premise is, um, three years ago, a friend and I, you know, we realized there was a major problem, and that is ordering beer at a bar. And, you know, if you're, if you're you know, a college grad or you've, you remember college, uh, going to the bar or even, you know, here in Stockholm, some of the bars is like you have to fight your way to get to the front. Um, you know, you're yelling your name. Sometimes they get your tab correct. Sometimes they don't. At the end of the night, you want to go check out, but that's another 15-minute wait. Uh, maybe you're sitting there and you're like, I'd really like another drink, but, you know, I want to stay with my friends. I, w I don't want to deal with all that stuff. So... Um, we decided to write a quick uh, back-end prototype in Erlang. Um, we also uh, wrote a front-end application um, for the, the patrons. And um, basically, we've grown from there. So I'm going to basically be telling the story of Vendi. And if you're wondering why the name changed, um, from I don't know if it's a colloquialism uh, internationally, but at least when you're in the US, the term wingman means um, basically someone who's trying to help you find a partner at a bar. Um, so the whole concept was, oh, you know, this application's your wingman, it's going to help you get drinks and stuff. Um, but once we went to go get funding, we realized uh, you know, people were a bit hesitant about that. Um, obviously, you know, there's probably you know, some uh, sexist undertones. We never intended it to be. Um, but just to be safe, we decided to rebrand ourselves. Uh, and, and since then, uh, there's also been a lot of process improvements. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about that. Um, but the big question is, can you build a successful startup in your spare time? And um, my answer to this is yes. And the, the question is, you know, how do you do it? And so let's talk about that. But first of all, you know, who, what's the who, what, when, where, why, and how? Um, I'm Jordan. Uh, is the nice, uh, thanks for the nice introduction. I currently work at Chef. Um, I've, I've been doing distributed systems for quite a long time. Uh, I've always been interested ever since I was a kid, and Erlang was kind of a natural fit for that. I started, I think, my first distributed system was in C++ or something. Um, then I messed around with OCaml and Haskell, and then I found this cool language that kind of combines distributed systems and functional language, and it was beautiful. So that was back in my freshman year of college, and now I'm here. So it was kind of dumb luck that I stumbled across a language that happens to be very popular now. And it's, it's kind of exciting, so now I'm talking here today. So I've also worked at Five9, which is, uh, it's still called a startup, but it's uh, fairly well-funded, self-sufficient, and generates a lot of money. And uh, it's called Five9. Uh, they're basically a telecom back-end systems company. Uh, before that, I worked at MITRE and Fermilab. And again, it was you know, these big distributed systems. For those unfamiliar with Fermilab, that's the particle collider that was used to uh, in Chicago. Now it's been replaced by the Large Hadron Collider. But it, with any of these systems, you know, you have these like kind of real-time systems that are distributed, you know, kilometers in a circle. Um, and it's always been a lot of fun for me. But what I'd also like to know is who are you? So um, first of all, can people raise their hands if they kind of use Erlang on a daily basis or that's their job? Cool. Uh, how many people here are? evaluating Erlang as maybe a potential solution to a problem they have or they're going to be having. Awesome. Uh, how many people here have wrote a mobile application on some kind of phone platform? Awesome. And finally, how many have wrote a web application? Doesn't have to be Erlang. Awesome. Nice, nice. That's good. We've got a nice crowd. So um, just to quickly introduce the rest of the team just so I can give them some credit, I co-founded this with Lionel Levine. Um, Basically, the, w the way we met was from a mutual friend. Uh, I met him the day before I was going to Kilimanjaro, and the day after he'd gotten in a fight, and so we both had interesting stories, and we started a bond. And he's like, hey, I'm working on this cool idea. I just won this uh, grant at Carnegie Mellon to develop it. And I'm like, well, hey, I'm a back-end engineer, and uh, you know, let's, let's combine forces and see what we can do. Um, since then, um, we kind of have like a core team of about six people. Um, but then we also have about 20 to 30 other people kind of around the country that help us in different markets and so on. Um, and, I, and just to be very clear, this is um, like this has all been privately funded. It's been very low cost. We've just kind of like utilized our college network and that entrepreneurial spirit of people have just graduated. Now they want to apply this new business knowledge, this marketing knowledge. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, again, if this is kind of focused for someone who has like 
kind of a big idea and they want to kind of do it at a low cost and you know what are the resources available for someone like that so um, to go a little bit more into the product um, it, it started simply as being able to order a drink on your phone your phone tells you when it's ready so it's asynchronous just like Erlang and once it's ready you get a uh, push notification and there's a, sp a special part of the bar that you just walk up to and be like Here's the code on my phone, bartenders, here's your drink, and you're good to go. The application is, already has your credit card in it, it takes care of charging it, and at the end of the night, uh, you can just close out your tab. If you're with friends, you could split the tab. Um, you know, it's the, the whole point of this is to just make it as easy for the customer as possible. On the same token, this actually helps uh, bars because it, it removes an inefficiency, right? These like. Um, everyone knows in queuing theory it's always good to have a single line, right? Then you disperse them across the people who can help you instead of just having everyone flood to all the available bartenders. And so we're trying to use technology to and apply it in that manner. Since then, um, we realized, you know, like, well, that's a cool problem. Um, it's not necessarily sustainable because when you're talking about mobile applications, mobile payment, um, ordering goods and services, uh, the margins are very slim, right? Because the, the credit card companies and the monopolies and everything else, they have enough power and enough breadth that they can you know, just basically push down the prices, so it's very hard to make money. Uh, the other thing is, um, one of the things we learned as we're going through this, we did a, a bunch of studies and analysis, and uh, maybe if you learn nothing else from this talk, realize that customers do lie to you. So if you give them a survey and you ask them a question, uh, one of the main questions was kind of the foundational question was, is someone willing to pay money for the convenience of ordering a drink by their phone? And so we posed the question, would you be willing to pay 15 cents per a drink if that meant not having to wait in line? And everyone's like, yeah, sign me up, sign me up. And you know, it sounded good in theory, but in practice, people become really finicky when you start adding these like, little charges. If they can say 15 cents, some people will wait 10 minutes. Um, there's a shop in, um, well, it started in Chicago, but it's in the U.S., it's called Jimmy John's. And they had this promotion where you could get a sub for $1, um, it was like this big promotion. There was people waiting in line for an hour and a half. You could not pay me money to wait in line just to get a sandwich, but, you know, people, they like good deals, they like values. And we were also dealing with um, kind of the, the Facebook Gmail effect, where everyone expects these services to be free. So we had to kind of change and realign a little bit and start focusing on, you know, have a good experience for the customer, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to make our money from the establishments. So yeah, why we got this kind of cool base system in place, how do we make the life easier for the establishment? Because also, they're the ones that have to adopt it initially. So um, what we do, well, well, the way we started was we gave them a free tablet, had our software on it, we gave them a free hotspot, and the way we initially got them to agree to it, even for the slight inconvenience, because you know, everything is free to them, they're still adopting a new system. Um, the, way, the way we're able to, at least at the end of the day, maybe help them on their margins a little bit, is a scenario where you're out with your friends, uh, you, go, you, know, you go to one bar and you're like, yeah, I'm kind of tired of this, let's go to the next bar, and by the end of the night, maybe you've gone to four or five bars. So in a normal scenario, you swipe your card at every bar. So you pay the, you know, there's always an upfront cost uh, on a transaction fee, and plus you always pay a percentage. Now, imagine instead of paying, you know, five different upfront costs, if you could pool those together and have one charge at the end of the night, which we're able to do with our platform, then you're only just paying that one upfront transaction cost. So you still have to pay that percentage, but you're at least saving a little bit of money, and we can pass those costs uh, onto the bars. And you may say, well, like, you know, does that really add up? And it does, because, you know, we're talking about college kids, who have like, you know, they're buying cheap drinks and they keep ordering, keep ordering, and you know, they go wherever the fun is, so they move around a lot during the night, and we have found that it actually does work. So that's one way, you know, at the end of the day we can say, worst case, uh, you get these free services and you'll probably save some money. So that was our initial sell. Um, but then, you know, we wanted to make their lives easier, so we started looking at analytics, inventory traction, uh, inventory tracking, and point of sale systems, and so on. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later, but that's uh, essentially the product. Also, um, I guess just one ground rule for my talk, I do like a dynamic talk, so if you have questions, feel free to ask at any time. And um, you know, I always um, have the right to you know, delay the answering it if I feel it's better for later on. So uh, again, just this is just a, um, 
I'm not as much on the business side, that's my partner, but there definitely is money to be made here. And I'm gonna go over some of the, you know, other people who are kind of in mobile payments. There are people who've also tried to do mobile ordering before. And so far, there's no clear winner. Um, it, you know, it's hard to tell if it's like, you know, the red ocean or blue ocean or, or what have you, but there's a lot of money, right? And so even if you get like a sliver of that, it, you, you may be able to, you know, at least self-sustain yourself. And for people who are programmers and engineers, that's kind of a dream job, right? To self-sustain yourself, be able to do what you love to do. And that's our goal. So these are just um, some of the recent ones. Uh, the most interesting case here, I think, is tabbed out. They were uh, the, the competitor we worried most about. Um, but they failed. But when they failed, they did us a huge favor. They posted why they failed, a huge write-up about all the things they tried, all their mistakes, all the wasted money. And we were able to learn from all that. And depending on what product you're doing, um, there's advantages to competitors beating you to the market initially for like a new niche that you're trying to develop. Um, the positive is the consumer has now experienced mobile payments, so they're familiar with it. They're maybe not as scared of it, just like when cell phones first came out, you know, like people are like, wait a second. Uh, but now you know, it's become a little more accepted, but at the same time, like for the most part, all of these uh, services that kind of targeted, you know, the bar scene, they all failed. And that can also leave a bad taste in the mouths of the people who have used those apps before. So you do have to kind of balance that as well. So if I were to you know, give some advice, I would say uh, what's, what's happened now is that you know, some of these bigger people, um, like Google, uh, PayPal, they're starting to develop mobile payment systems. Um, I know Klarna is here in Europe. Um, we're not like you know necessarily directly competing with them. In fact, you know if we c if we plan to be able to use them t as payment methods as well, and we're more focused on ordering. But you those those companies as soon as you know there, there's always the risk, right? As soon as you see someone else is making money from a the application of their product, you know they may try to jump in there. So it's the way our approach was, you know, instead of being out on the West Coast with all these other people kind of beating each other up, we started in the East Coast in Pittsburgh by Carnegie Mellon, um, this area called Oakland. And from there, um, we were able to kind of be in a bubble, like no one knew about us. And this allowed us to like learn from everyone else who's being very public, right? Like all these big companies, for whatever reason, startups, like they want to make like, you know, hacker news and all these different websites because they think that's helpful. But I think a lot of times that almost forces you to go too fast too soon. And then you feel like you just have to go, you know, go for bust and they go all out and they fail. So we got really lucky in that we were, we were in an area where we're well networked. Um, a lot of us went to school in that area, so we, we know all the bars, we know the bartenders, we know the owners, we know the students, we know all the organizations. And so we had a very friendly audience while we were testing this for the first year. And you know, we had around, I think at most, 200 users in a night. Uh, we never publicly launched. This was all, again, we controlled everything because we, you know, it's like a study. Uh, that's you know, kind of the lean methodology, right? You, you have a hypothesis and you test it and you keep iterating over that. And in doing so, we found out that, you know, we're not going to make money on transactions. So we have to offer services, right? We have to use this data. We have to um, basically sell something that doesn't exist already. So what we, what we do is um, we have basically um, two main income sources. One is ad revenue. And it's not a typical ad, right? It's not going to be like an in-game ad. It's going to be you have your phone, you walk by a bar, all of a sudden you get a pop-up and you're like, hey, if you come into this bar, you can get two for one drinks. You know, you have your, your GPS coordinates and they're able to do like live deals. And the best part is, is I get this notification on my phone. You're essentially assured that they see it. They either click it or they don't. So like you definitively know if that ad worked on that person or not. Also, if you do different specials during the week, um, maybe you have ladies night, you have different happy hours, maybe trivia night. You can see you know, what clientele comes from these different types of specials. And now you're allowing the establishments themselves to you know, use these analytics to, to test their own hypothesis. So you know, we're, in a, in a sense, empowering them. 
And of course, you can aggregate all this information and probably resell it to people like Budweiser who are trying to also target the demographics and learn more about them. Um, so there's, there's lots of potential. Um, again, it is like, you know, why did we choose colleges, right? Because for us to make money, to get more data, we, we care about quantity, not necessarily quality of the booze, if you will. So like the more people order drinks and like we can see the type of drinks they order and, you know, naturally these are going to be college students. So even if we decide to charge the establishment maybe five cents per drink that everyone orders, that adds up very quickly, you know. People can drink 12 beers in a night if it's like a Budweiser, right? I know you guys, you know, in Europe, that's... Uh, I don't worry, I don't like it either, but. <laughs> so where do we stand presently? So as I said before, and I'm not saying this has been the best method, but we're still alive and we're still very viable. So it's, you know, and as far as I know, there's no existing competitors that are at least public that are still out there uh, competing against us. So again, we had kind of this trial period over a year, and this was essentially me programming everything in my spare time. So this is doable, it's achievable. Um, I did, we did outsource like a little bit of design work and things like that. Um, but you know, it depends on your situation, how quickly you have to get to market or not. But we've been lucky so far. Uh, so now we've, you know, we've, we've done all these studies, we found out the features that bars need, and we've developed our product over time. And now we're, you know, we're actually, my partner's in New York City right now working on funding and we're planning to do a full public launch in the first quarter of next year. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of exciting, kind of cool, and it's all been in Erling, so I've, I've always been very happy. So that's kind, of, that's kind of the business side of things, and I'll come back a, a little bit more about kind of the future and what we're looking to do, and, and basically show you all the things that are possible in Erling. But for now, um, this is also an architecture talk, so I am going to give a high-level talk. But as I said in the description of the talk, I, it, it should hopefully be understandable to most people. So it's very simple. We have a REST interface uh, right now. It's implemented in Web Machine. Um, you may ask, why not Cowboy? Why not something else? Um, this was, uh, I literally started three years ago. Uh, Web Machine was the, the big player at the time. Cowboy was out, but it was a little bit buggy. It's gotten a lot better since then. And if I, you know, if I had the time, I probably would put in Cowboy. Um, but also, we have, um, I have a bunch of modules for different payment providers, like uh, Ogon is one in Europe. Uh, Offnet is obviously the US. And there's also, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about some of the other modules and stuff that are, are going to be part of this. Um, and if you didn't read the description, all this is going to be open source today. So you'll have access to all these different modules for interacting with all these different payment providers and a bunch of other services that will make your life easier. But I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, then on the back end, um, the, the database is Postgres. I actually started with Couch. And uh, for whatever reason, it just, you know, I did some early on testing. Always a good thing to do early testing and found out it just wouldn't hold up. The response times would be kind of weird and it was never consistent and I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Um, I will admit, I, I just like used a, a hosted couch provider and I used the free plan because you know I'm trying to bootstrap on nothing basically. And it didn't work out. So I talked uh, with my friend, uh, Tristan Slaughter. He actually works at Heroku, also a big user of Erlang. And they also offer hosted Postgres. So you know, I kind of told him my situation and I was like, well, yeah, why don't you just use Postgres? And I'm like, well, I already have everything in JSON and I can just store that immediately in couch. You know, it's kind of annoying. He's like, well, you know, I've actually been thinking about writing this application to, you know, facilitate that, right? Be able to read and write JSON to Postgres uh, efficiently. And that's what we did. So we came up with a program uh, for doing that, and that's also already open sourced. And I'll talk about that also a little bit later. But this is just kind of a, a high-level view. And it may seem simple, but it, it really is. I mean, once you look at the code, it's, you know, a, a couple of applications. There's not that many lines. And uh, that's the beauty of Erlang, right? You can rapidly prototype these things. Um, so, uh, going a little bit more into the, the interactions that this, you know, kind of framework provides, and I should be very clear, like, this is still kind of at an alpha state. You know, I haven't had, you know, the, the, the time and the resources to make this necessarily enterprise ready. So, it very much is a work in progress, but it's, you know, it's, it's held up for me, and I've, you know, I've tested it fairly well. 
Um, so, like if you look at the code, it's like not everything is completely specced out. There's you know a little cruft here and there, but for the most part, it works well. But um, I think the the biggest benefits is you get you know you, there's a a client for Urban Airship, a client for PubNub that you can use. Uh, Urban Airship is push notifications that work for almost any phone. A great service. Um, PubNub is obviously a published subscribe provider. So uh, I interact with all those. And this is actually the full list of the technologies used. So I already talked about Heroku. I talked about Postgres. Uh, I use JSX. Um, I provide alternatives for some of these. Um, this is just kind of a, a high level view for if you're trying to approach a project. Like th these are kind of the, the libraries that I've used and in some cases that I believe are kind of the best that exists now. Um, where I provide alternatives, I think it's still kind of up in the air. Um, just a, uh, one a note on Peeps Out, this was actually uh, another startup, and they were uh, kind of our first collaboration. So the premise behind Peeps Out is they put a webcam in every bar. And the goal of that is like I can look at my phone and I can see what kind of activity is going on at that bar. Maybe I want a quiet bar so I can just have a, a nice drink with a friend, or maybe I want to go dancing and I want to go to a place that's packed. So we've combined Peeps Out with our application so they can you know, find the bar they want, then go there, and, and now they have all the ordering capabilities. You know, everything's on their phone, and that's all great. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, if you're going to use Heroku, even not these, these uh, services um, are also usable outside of Heroku, but Blitz is really great um, for doing load testing. Uh, it's like basically load testing from the cloud. Uh, Paper Trail is uh, really good for Heroku. Um, it's just a nice view, a quick view of your logs. Um, so I definitely recommend those. And now I'm just going to go over a quick demo of the code. And then just show you, like, you know, kind of how easy it is to go. All right. So it's already built, so I'm just going to start it. Okay, so if I cat user one, as you can see, you, know, you just have a user ID. Um, I will, for this kind of like talk, I've kind of simplified things a little bit, so this isn't like the exact actual code. Uh, I just wanted to make it a little easier for the talk. Um, but we can go ahead and run this command, and we'll see, yay, it worked. We got a key. Awesome. Um, now let's go ahead and do an order. Um, there's also a login, but we've made it so when you register, you can also just generate your key at the same time. So I'll go ahead and skip that. Um, so if I cat order, um, basically you'll you'll see it's the user, and these drinks are mapped to a menu that's on the server side. Um, we support things like pickup, or you can also get service to your table. These were different things that evolved over time as uh, a request came in. Um, I don't want to actually charge my card, and it's not a real card anyway, so it's $0. Um, the other thing is we also force them to supply both the key and the password, just as like kind of a make sure if someone steals your phone, they have to like retype their password before they can order a drink. Um, oh, no. Bad arg. Oh, well, well that's not too important. Um, Yeah, I mean, this wasn't meant to be too much demo, but it worked before. Anyways, um, the other thing I want to talk about, the two main points um, that I've, I th this, is, this is things I've learned in the past three years. Like, when I first wrote this code, uh, I think DevOps was just beginning. And, you know, continuous integration was around, but now we have this, like, whole continuous deployment, continuous delivery. They're finally becoming popular. We have the lean methodology of Kanban and all this cool stuff. But I really do recommend that if you want to have any kind of product that you're doing on, you do need continuous integration at the very least, and you also want to have some kind of continuous deployment. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like one button. That's the ideal. Uh, in my case, it's like uh, essentially two buttons. So if you have an Erlang project and it's on GitHub, you should be using Travis. All you have to do is simply add this file in your top level and you know, replace script with whatever builds it. Um, if you're just using a, gen uh, a general rebar application, Heroku is going to be smart enough to know about it. Uh, or sorry, Travis is going to be smart enough to know about it. 
um, but you can specify the all the different versions of Erlang to make sure everything's backward compatible. You know, like they changed the types with like dict and uh, a few other things. So, great, easy, free way to test your open source software. Um, now, Heroku eyes. So, uh, again, you don't have to use Heroku. Um, you don't have to even use uh, you know a provider of of a hosted platform. You can you can do it yourself. There's open source tools to spin that up yourself. But you should you should be setting it up in such a way that you have a reproducible way to deploy your software. And Heroku is really easy for that. Um, I'm not sure if Erlang is still unofficially supported or officially yet. But again, Heroku uses Erlang very heavily internally, so it it always works. I've never had an issue. And now they're also working on being able to let the, the different nodes talk together. It used to be you had your node, you couldn't talk outside of it. Um, but now you can create these connections where you can actually you know, uh, spin up EPMD and have you know, two nodes talking to each other. And it's actually pretty cool. So, um, um, And a lot of you probably know people from Heroku in the community too, and they're always happy to help. So it's, it's been really nice. So I'm going to basically show you how to um, basically make this work on Heroku. I say from uh, local to hosted and 60 seconds. Um, I maybe you'll be able to do that. We'll see. I think I could if I wasn't giving a talk. So the first thing uh, you, you just want to do is I like have the the depths and the beam files and stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of those. Um, I also just uh, added all the files with Git, um, made an initial commit, and now everything's just in a nice little local Git repository. Um, now I can do Heroku login, uh, answer my details. Cool. Um, now I want to go ahead and create the project. So the way you do this with Erlang is you have these things called build packs. And right now, I think there's there was like an original build pack, and then it kind of forked to a newer one. Uh, I'm still using the older one just because it works, and there's you know little differences with the new one. So, anyways, um, this basically told Heroku, "I have this project. I want you to. It's an Erlang project. I want you to take care of it when I push it to you." So Heroku's like, "Okay." Um, so you also want to add your keys, and Heroku is very nice. If you didn't already have a key, it would have generated it for you. Um, now we're going to go ahead and add the Postgres database. So again, this is completely free uh, at the development level, and I've had no issues. Um, if you pay more money, you basically get more caching. OK. Um, now there's just this uh, nuanced thing to promote it to being the primary database. So if you run Heroku, con or, whoops, not dash, run Hoku, Heroku config, it'll actually print out. These are going to be the environment uh, and variables that you have access to once your software is on uh, Heroku. So this database URL is something you can actually parse out um, when your application is starting, and then use that and connect to it, and that, that's your database. Uh, I also will mention that you know Heroku has these like other cool features, like you can have databases that follow each other, which in essence creates uh, uh, mirrors of the database. Um, so the other thing is I, I just have a, hold on. Uh, that makes sense, okay. So need to go back and get the, this URL, and I need to go to the place the code is already built, because I deleted all my stuff that I needed. Oh. All right, so I'm just setting it locally now. Um, this is just this is spinning up dick dick, and then just creating uh, users establishments and orders uh, table on the database. Again, normally like this is all taken care of behind the scenes, but I wanted to at least expose some of the stuff. So that's all cool. 
Um, now you just commit everything. Fourteen. Whoops, have to add everything first. Uh, what? Maybe I already had. Oh, that's what it was. All right, I need to. Reinitialize it. I was practicing before and I forgot to clear it out. So we'll go ahead and just redo that. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so everything's committed. Um, now we can just push. Liquid is not created to get request. Oh. Since I redid it, I have to do this part again. I apologize. Okay, then go ahead and add this again. Give me, oh, it gave me a bronze one. This is one annoyance. It, it seems to just randomly decide which type of database it's going to give you. Okay, so now we can go ahead and push it. So this is uh, literally pushing to Heroku's uh, GitHub server. And once it has a hook on the server side that no recognizes we specified an Erlang build pack, gets the build pack, it knows how to pull down the dependencies using rebar, and now it's building it. And it usually takes you know around 45 seconds or so. Anyways, we can go back to it. Yeah. So that's kind of uh, just a, a quick tech part. I, I don't want to get involved too much because you can read the code for yourself. Um, but I did, I did just want to, again, kind of a lessons learned thing. Um, so one thing we did, um, we outsourced a lot of our logos and stuff to 99designs. That's a great service. Uh, for the establishment application, um, it's very important that you realize you know, who's going to be using your software. So if it's a bartender, they're very busy, so you need something that's responsive. So uh, having a native application was very important. Um, but for the phone application, it was just going to be way too much work, uh, again, without money, to support two separate platforms initially. So we used the phone gap, which when we use it, it was, again, we were kind of an early adopter of it. And it was a little slow, a little buggy, but it's gotten better over time. But even with that, um, if you had to choose and you have the resources, I always recommend building native apps. Because what we've had to do is basically pay a ton of technical debt. We've had to do a lot of JavaScript tweaks on the individual iOS and individual Android. And the phone gap pieces are pretty much non-existent now. Um, and, and once we do get funding, we do plan to rewrite both to be native. Uh, we also have a web portal. This allows. Um, the, the establishments to look at their menus, update them, and so on and so forth. And one thing uh, we also are starting to integrate is inventory management. So, you know, let's say you want uh, a vodka Red Bull or something, but they're all out of Red Bull, and now I order a drink, and I'm like, why isn't it working? I go to the bartender, and it's like, oh, yeah, we're out of Red Bull, sorry. Um, you know, I had to cancel your order. Um, if we were able to track the inventory and integrate that, we would know when they're out. And then the menu automatically updates, and Again, this just kind of streamlines their process, makes their lives easier, uh, and in the end, it makes everyone happy. It's kind of an everyone wins situation. So the future. So my biggest goal is this is somehow used by someone else to do something. I, I don't care what. I've had two ideas that I would like maybe to do. One is everyone's probably familiar with the Starbucks app. With this, you could easily make that for any independent coffee shop you want. I think you could do it in a week. 
Um, I just, it's not my priority, but it would be really awesome if it just a private coffee shop wants to have their own mobile application, they could use this. The other thing I've been looking at is I have a, a friend, Eric Merritt, who's also in the community, and he's, uh, he married a Peruvian woman, so I was in Peru for his wedding. And one thing there is not a, no one has credit cards. You pay everything in cash, and Peru these days is becoming a bit unsafe, so it's not always fun to carry cash. But it, but it would be nice if you can basically use this as kind of like a mobile bank. So like I could literally go to a bar that supports Fendi, give them you know ten dollars, uh, or ten soles or whatever it is, and they could credit that to my account. And you essentially the bars become like you know mini ATMs, right? So I can just take my cash to a safe place. I get credit on my account, and now it's on my phone, which you know. Maybe that's not completely safe, but you can obviously you know, have encryption and, and different mechanisms. So if someone steals your phone, they're at least not able to use your money. And it's, it's better than carrying cash. Um, again, my friend Eric was actually held at gunpoint in Peru, so it's a, a very real threat. And uh, you know, I've been in, um, you know, in, in Tanzania as well, and it's like these aren't places that have credit cards, they don't have loans, they don't have anything like that. So being able to make their lives a little easier, because everyone does have a cell phone, you know, they, they they came late to the game, but that means they had access to, like, they got to decide how to build their new infrastructure with the best available technology. So their technology is actually really good and could support something like this. Um, as one final kind of teaser before I answer questions, there's another project I'm working on uh, with Eric Merritt, again, and Ram Singh. Um, you may know them or you may not. But uh, it's called VoteRaise.com. Uh, we're basically going to be a Kickstarter for political campaigns. So let's say you're, you want to test the waters, you want to see if you can get enough money to be a viable candidate. If you get 1,000 people to pledge $100, it crosses a threshold, you automatically become a candidate, and life is good. So this allows you, you know, this is, makes it a little safer for me as a, a constituent. Um, maybe like, I'd really love to support this third party candidate, but I just don't want to throw money at him if he's not even going to run or doesn't get enough support. Um, we've partnered with Trevor Potter. Some of you may know him from the Colbert Report. Uh, he's the one who helped with the super PAC. Uh, he's, so uh, that's kind of cool. He's basically the expert on PACs. And um, to be very clear, you know, in the U.S. there's been a lot of um, stuff around, you know, don't the campaign laws and stuff. We're basically trying to make everything transparent, right? So, like, there's these laws now, like, basically banning limits and all this stuff. Um, we're not, I want to be very clear, we're not trying to take advantage of that. We're merely trying to, like, we want to show, like, you know, is it good money? Is it bad money that's coming to this district? And so people can, you know, have a clear picture. But the part you probably care about is we're doing everything in OCaml, which is a really cool language. It's a, another functional language, obviously. And we're going to be open sourcing that in September. Um, we'll be giving a talk at CUFP. And we have uh, integration with DynamoDB, Amazon Dy DynamoDB, Amazon SQS. Um, we basically have complete support for I, uh, management roles and EC2, everything. Like you, like, you literally compile your code, and if you want it to go, it goes through all this testing, uses all these systems, they're all scalable. Um, we have libraries for all of that. And right now, the, the kind of last piece is the bank integration piece. Um, I think once we solve that problem, that'll actually be also be very helpful to people, because right now, for most banks, there's no APIs. You're basically FTPing these different types of files, and it's a mess. So we're also trying to clean that up. So uh, if, if you're, like, you know, you love Erlang, but you want to try something new. Uh, I think the stuff we're doing on OCaml is going to be really exciting for a lot of people. Um, and I do want to just you know, give credit to the people at Mirage OS, because we are using some of their work. And they're doing some really cool stuff, too, with the deploying these like minimal virtual machines on bare metal and all that cool stuff. So you should check them out as well. Um, so yeah, basically, lessons learned. Erlang's awesome. Testing's awesome. Automation is awesome. You guys are all awesome. Uh, I appreciate you for, uh, for listening. And I really do hope um, you know someone does something with this or some parts of it. Um, but if you don't, you know, like definitely try doing startups. It's fun. It's a great experience. Please open source your code because we all benefit, and you know we're all a community. This is still a very small community, so it's very appreciative when you give back. And um, if anyone's new to Erlang and hasn't learned, I just just give a shameless plug. Uh, we do this thing called Erlang Camp. Um, once or twice a year, and it's a two-day course, and it basically assumes you know almost nothing, and at the end of the day, you can write an Erlang program. Um, that said, uh, the code is going to be there. I just have one last scrub to remove proprietary stuff. Um, I'll do that in like an hour.
and thank you. Andy. So we have time for a few questions, I think. There, we have one. First of all, uh, thanks very much mm -hmm. for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. Yep. First question is, uh, do you think you can uh, grow your startup organically? Because you mentioned you're now asking for funding, and as you mentioned, you're also self-sustained, so I'm confused yeah. a bit. How are I you going to make money out of people's money? And second question is, how do bars manage their uh, menus? So when a new barman introduces a new drink, how do they push this to the, to the yeah. applications? Yeah, so we have a vendor portal. Uh, it's actually it's based on the, the patron code because it's like when you're looking at a bar's menu, I mean, it's read-only, and we just made that like read-write and put a web interface on that. So yeah, we definitely support that. Uh, we also support things like specials, um, like order modifications. If like you want to order a pizza and have all these different toppings, we, we support all of that. Uh, we support like you know, if you want 50% off like certain days of the week or two for one. All that, and that's all integrated into the vendor portal. You can specify all those different things. Uh, as far as funding goes, it's you know I think I think we could do it, but I, I I feel like we're maybe lessening our risk a little bit, and I think we're getting to the point too where we've been okay with going slow, but I think now we kind of do have to try to make that jump, and we're not asking for a ton of money. We're just we just want money basically to buy the hardware. Like we we give every bar a tablet and an, uh, um, a wireless access point, um, you know, just like a, just so we eliminate any variables, we control the hardware, we make sure the internet's always working. Uh, and besides that, then it's just, it's just pure marketing money. So it's like maybe like a couple hundred thousand dollars, um, you know, compared to how much money other people try to get. I think it's fairly reasonable. And it's also to develop these bigger features like uh, POS integration and stuff like that, which is, is time consuming. Okay, we have another one here. Uh, from what I saw, you have uh, you support two payment providers. Yes. Uh, do you have any issues with PCI compliance and s such stuff? Yeah, we are PCI compliant. Um, actually, the for Offnet at least, if you go through the whole PCI compliance, there's like different levels. But the if you go through the complete process, you get better rates and you don't get charged these monthly fees, which are in essence insurance. So yeah, uh, it's it is lengthy though. It took me probably a week to go through it all. Okay, uh, and do you? I assume you have libraries, Erlang li libraries that interface with Auth.net and this. Other yeah, those are actually on Erlware right now on GitHub. Oh, okay, so they yeah. are open source. Because I open sourced some parts of it earlier, but now I'm like this is just kind of the last core part. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we have another one. Thanks for the talk. Uh, yep. I wonder, uh, how do you compare uh, web development with Erlang with other popular technologies? Because I can, uh, I have an image, how, how would it be with Erlang? Because I've, I've been working uh -huh. with Erlang. And once you s start the rolling, if you need to expand your group, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be a problem to find developers, for example? Well, this may, I may offend some people with this comment, but um, Erlang is a kind of a self-selecting language. So people that know Erlang uh, tend to be better engineers because it requires a little more investment in your personal time. And I would rather hire one really solid Erlang engineer than 10, you know, kind of mid-level Java engineers. And I think by having smaller teams, you're more efficient. And I think at the end of the day, you know, like the, the pros outweigh the cons. So like, yeah, it is harder to find someone, but there are there's still enough Erlang developers, yeah, and they're at a bit of a premium these days, but it's it's not much more than for a high-end Java developer. And also, I think, you know, for like, like with any functional language, you spend more time thinking about the problem, and then the implementation just kind of follows the solution, right? You you think of it in your mind. Whereas I, I always felt like, and this may be because I was younger, but like with Java, it's like you're struggling more with the language versus solving the problem. and. So I think you know the benefits completely outweigh any negatives, and there are plenty of companies now that have proven that the risk of using Erlang, it's not that big of a risk. They've been successful, so it's mostly mitigated. Uh, one. 
I think okay. we're actually running out of time, so I just want to thank you. It was yeah. a very bold presentation, lots of demos, and <laughs> another you. round of applause. And don't forget to vote. <laughs> thank you.